am very happy uh, to introduce to you Brad Whaler, who is uh, also going to do an introduction for our keynote speaker. Brad, as the uh, chairman and co-founder of Kuali Foundation, has uh, just been a spectacular personality, a uh, great uh, founder, inventor, and um, innovator. And I think the Kuali Foundation was just lucky to have him uh, get this started. Once again, looking out there and seeing all the people and seeing how big this community has gotten, it's something very exciting and something I hope we're all excited to be a part of. And with that, I bring you Brad Wheeler. Thank you. <laughs> Good morning. You guys are looking pretty good after the uh, uh, full day of the workshops and then yesterday the conference program. And I know those extended Kuali meetings you tend to have in the evenings uh, at conferences like this. It's my uh, really deep and personal pleasure to introduce to you Indiana University President Michael McRobbie. As a native Australian, he came to IU in 1997 at the invitation of then IU President Miles Brand, to be our first Vice President for IT and Chief Information Officer over all campuses. In 1998, he led the development of a very forward-looking and transformative IT strategic plan and then relentlessly implemented it. I know that to be true. The outcomes of that work really changed everything for Indiana University, and it changed our trajectory in the work of information technology for the mission of the institution. It included a major overhaul of our administrative systems, deep partnerships with the library to create the digital library program, advances in classroom and instructional technology, investments in advanced networking and computing and storage for researchers. The latter investments and strategy were years ahead of the conversations we're having today about cyber infrastructure for researchers uh, across the nation. In 2003, he took on the additional responsibility as Vice President for Research, and in 2006, the trustees appointed him as Interim Provost for the Bloomington campus. In 2007, Michael was named as IU's 18th President. And during this time, and even in today's arduous economic circumstances, the university has excelled by all measures, indicators of research funding, philanthropy, and excellence in the student body, and many other indicators of great universities. But for our session and for today, I will focus on one critical point that is inescapable. We simply would not be here 800 strong at Kuali Days without the support and advocacy of Michael McRobbie. While you may know many of the IU faces that have long worked with you to labor on the Kuali projects and create the things that we have today, few of you know how that work has been quietly enabled behind the scenes and championed over many years by Michael McRobbie. I want you to know that before there was ever uttered the word Kuali, before there were any committed investors for what is now the Kuali financial system, before there was hope of a Mellon grant, and before Nakubo had concluded affirmative ambivalence regarding the passion of the CFOs for an open source financial system, and even before Sakai had released a credible version of software, Michael McRobbie agreed to advance a quarter million dollars for a strategic bet that universities could collaborate together to produce better software at lower cost than other approaches. Your attendance today proves again that in 2004, Michael made a very wise investment and that in doing so, <clears throat> he has already saved the university well over $16 million by having confidence in all of you. I'm pleased to introduce my friend, colleague, and my boss, Michael McRobbie. <laughs> Well, um, thank you very much, Brad, for that uh, very kind introduction, much appreciated. And I'm glad you told people that um, I'm Australian, because otherwise I don't think you would have worked it out for yourselves. <laughs> Let me also thank you, Jennifer, for your uh, invitation to, to speak uh, to you today. I really am uh, delighted 
to be able to speak to you. And it's extraordinarily impressive to see so many people here, uh, all, I think, united by their interest in the, the, the promise and the vision and the actuality uh, of the Kowali uh, project. And uh, I know we have a number of board members of the Kowali Foundation as well here, so my, my welcome to, to all of them. I want to just start with um, some scene setting by, by, by some, just some comments about a, a, a recent event, and that, of course, was the very unfortunate passing of, of Steve Jobs. But, 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 but Steve Jobs, I think, in his life and uh, extraordinary career, really uh, exemplified many of the factors that I think have all brought you here today. And I think many of you have been um, familiar with and much affected by his ideas and products, not just at Apple, but at Pixar and uh, at, um, at Next as well. And as people have said uh, many times, what was so different, though, about Jobs was that he, he really did think differently. And he had a way of conceptualizing things in, in, a, in a form that just seemed so obvious when you saw it, but had necessitated such an enormous struggle to get to that place. He looked at the same problems and opportunities as others. He looked at the same trends in small screens and batteries and material sciences. He looked at the same challenges in desktop computing and laptops and music and mobile phones and tablets as others. Yet he really did, at the end of the day, think differently, and in doing so, he changed the world, maybe one of the, the greatest technological innovators the world's ever seen. But today I'm also delighted to be here with so many leaders in higher education who have dared to, to think and act differently to what has been the dominant orthodoxy in our field for so many years. And the opportunities and challenges that it confront universities and colleges require us to do just that. Now, Brad made just a few comments about the, the history and the background to Koali, but when Barry Walsh first approached me in uh, 2003 about the possibility of an open source financial information system, I have to say from the, from the very beginning, I actually thought this was a remarkably sensible idea. And the reason for that was my own background. I'm a computer scientist. And in computer science, the development of software for some scientific purpose uh, that is then made freely available to the broader research community for application by them or by further enhancement or improvement of development and so on. This has been a standard way of working since the very earliest days of computing. The first program that I used in my research as a, as a young beginning graduate student was developed in just this way. And it was made, the program, this particular program that I remember using 1975 was made freely available to anybody in the world who wanted to use it. Well, the research group that I was then working in uh, took this program and we in turn developed it, took the basic ideas and concepts and algorithms in it, and we developed it in ways that we then made freely available to any other researchers in the, in the world who, who wanted the software that, uh, that we had developed as well. And then later I, as a a faculty member and a researcher, I, I co-authored the first of my books on research that had been derived from an artificial intelligence program that the co-authors of the book and I developed to prove theories of mathematical logic. And this program we, of course, then made freely available to the research community uh, worldwide. And for all I know, this I confess that these days other things occupy my mind, but as far as I know, this... Uh, program may still be in use somewhere in the world, either in its original form, probably not in some highly modified form. So this model of software development isn't new. And not only is it used standardly, and not only has it been used standardly in computer science from the very beginning of that discipline, but it is these days used in just about every other scientific and scholarly discipline at long ago transcended the boundaries of just the hard sciences of chemistry and physics and astronomy and so on as well. It is variously called 
the, the open source model or the community source model. But what was, what was basically new with Barry's idea was to use this model, a model very familiar to me, very familiar to others, but to use this model for a core university administrative system. And there is nothing more core than an institution's financial information system. For academics, for researchers, a critical bug or compiling error can put the, the work of students and researchers temporarily on hold. And this tends, unless you're running up against some conference deadline or some publication deadline, this tends to be something you can cope with. However, a problem with a critical administrative system can have much broader consequences. For example, people don't get paid. In the previous year, we had begun to establish the Sakai Consortium with, with Stanford and MIT and Michigan. And this, of course, is a now uh, immensely successful uh, consortium project. And, and like this consortium, it has gone on and developed in other ways. And this, of course, was to develop a community source-based course management system. Our work already in this project had, had really, I think, given us some, some confidence. But as important as course management software is, it is still not as core as the systems that ensure that people are paid or that keep the auditable financial books of a multi-billion dollar university. But my sense was that the same concept of developing, of sharing and maintaining critical software as a community, within a community, could also work for complex administrative systems. And, and here, let me stress that, that the, even this idea had been around a long time. People had thought about putting together consortia to develop uh, administrative software, and there had been some, even some efforts to do this. But to the best of my knowledge, they were, always, they were always efforts to do this from scratch, to start from scratch. Uh, and and uh, any large computer software project with multiple partners where you're starting from scratch as opposed to something concrete, uh, is necessarily uh, very, very difficult. It means people sitting around with whiteboards for hours and hours and hours um, arguing about um, how you should start and what the first line of code should be and so on. Um, and uh, is simply, I think, has been demonstrated historically to, sim to be not as successful as a project and actually start with something tangible that is the basis on which a project moves forward. I think the beauty about the Sakai project was that it took pieces developed by IU and Michigan and, and Sanford and MIT and basically welded them together, the best of breed among the various component modules to, to form Sakai. So there was, there was tangible material to start that project with. And here, of course, the, the tangible product was some of the work that had been done uh, by Barry and others at IU to develop the IU financial information system. But if we were to make this work and expand, expand it to many other universities, we'd obviously have to deal with some important questions about maintaining the integrity of the software, determining who would have permission to modify it. And after we developed the, the first version, how would it be sustained and who would provide support to the institutions when they needed, when they needed help? Interestingly, to, to digress a minute here, um, th those the, though these are absolutely crucial and fundamental questions when it comes to administrative software that you, to which you uh, uh, give major functions within an institution, I, I think that the research community has for some time started to realize that these are actually equally as important to the, to the research community, uh, that no longer can the research community uh, see the, uh, the, the, the running and control of, of um, uh, uh, key software to graduate students who might uh, run it for a few years until they graduate and then no one knows how to run that particular um, system which they, which they developed. When you, when you have multi-million dollar NIH grants and when you have scientific integrity and compliance issues resting on, on the validity and the integrity of that underlying software base, these questions, which are so fundamental to the administrative computing world, I think are, are now seen more and more as being ultimately just as fundamental to the, to the research world. 
and maybe the only difference is one of, of um, speed and immediacy here. So I don't think at that stage we really knew how to answer all of those questions. But we had ideas and thoughts about the economics. But obviously they, they would need to be worked through uh, if this new path for ministry assistance was to work. Now, the educational and research missions of the university were at the heart of this decision, as were the economics of developing administrative software at a scale that would reduce cost for all participating institutions. At the time we were considering the decision, we were completing a large-scale re-engineering of uh, our student information system, actually a replacement of a student information system and HR systems, and we were transitioning those to PeopleSoft implementations. And this transition was actually successful. Um, it's a roughly on budget and on time, unlike many other ones. But it was not without significant cost. It was a very expensive process. And I was then in a first-hand position to see just how much the, the, the overall total cost of this project, the purchase, the implementation, and ultimately the, the uh, support at the right levels, at, at all levels, of these off-the-shelf systems actually cost. And once we would made this transition, we began to consider the future of our financial information system, which we had, as I said, developed ourselves, but which was by then getting close to 10 years old, and so we had already begun to explore alternatives for its eventual replacement. And some of the options we considered were to turn to commercial products like PeopleSoft's financial information system to carry out a major upgrade of our own system, or the idea that was then emerging to work collaboratively, collaboratively with other universities to share cost and risk by creating a new financial information system that would suit their needs as well. So recent developments in information technology caused some of those involved in a a number, number of those people are in this room to, to think differently about the future of those critical systems. Uh, the development of the Internet 2 network and the development of regional optical networks were increasingly providing the, the level of high-speed connectivity among universities and this had greatly accelerated the work of informal software development communities. Internet tools were maturing and these encouraged collaboration and we'd already observed the, the growing success of, of Linux as, a, as an operating system and of Apache as the dominant web serving software and, and many, many, many other open source software systems as well. An issue was whether universities could take the steps necessary to harness these new schools, to pool our resources, to agree on a system design, and then to make it happen. And I believed, as did a number of others at IU, that we could. And Sakai had given us confidence, not only that it would work, but that we could get funding for such a consortial effort. And there is nothing like funding to help spur consortial efforts. And, and here um, I should pay a great tribute to, to Ira Fuchs from the Mellon Foundation, who, who was, um, uh, I think, a, a leading light behind uh, the efforts to fund these open source software projects. He, uh, Ira uh, convened a committee, which I was uh, honored to be a member, chaired by John Hennessy, the president of Stanford, in the, um, in the early 2000s. Uh, and we came up with a recommendation to the, to the Mellon board that funding such projects was, uh, was an extremely good idea. And that in turn led to uh, considerable funding by the, the Mellon Foundation. And, and Ira deserves enormous credit for that. In fact, we at IU we wanted to recognise Ira's maybe not fully heralded achievement and we awarded him one of our most prestigious awards just a few weeks ago at the opening of a new UIT building on our Bloomington campus. But leaders in IU in finance also believe we could do this as well and I want to commend and I'm delighted that she's here, the then Chief Financial Officer of Indiana University, Judy Palmer, who from the very outset was a, a strong and effective advocate um, of, for, this, for this project. And, and um, CFOs and CIOs don't always agree. And Judy, Judy will remember that as well as anybody. But, but, but on this one, Judy was absolutely from the first day fully behind this project. She deserves enormous credit for, 
IU's participation in this project, and as does Kathleen McNeely, who is with her, who's now the CFO at the NCAA as well. And they were both supporters of this initiative from the outset. And both of them really did understand the need for a financial information system that would run without a proliferation of shadow systems, which I think are the bane of all our existences. And commercial products, I think, were simply at that point just less capable of achieving this goal than our own ageing financial system, given that people had experience with it and were used to it as well. So another factor arose around this time that influenced our decision to support a multi-university open source approach. As we were considering our plans, I, around this time, I received an offer from a commercial vendor to give IU a free license to a financial system Though, of course, this did not include all the years of maintenance and support that this would, that this would uh, involve. And the vendor suggested that universities really didn't need to replicate what was already available for purchase on the market. But rather than be tempted by this offer, I was convinced by it that we were onto something <laughs> and that we could make a difference for higher education. A commercial offer of a free financial system, if we wouldn't join together to make an open source system for universities, in my mind doubly confirmed that we should collaborate with other universities, <laughs> drawing on our institutional expertise to tailor the systems we needed to take care of our own interests. And you know much of the history that followed and the events that bring us here today. And I must uh, give enormous credit to all of, all of you who have obviously shown in many cases um, you've made the institutional commitment uh, or are seriously considering making the institutional commitment to Kuali and the various Kuali subsystems uh, to be part of the core IT infrastructure of your institutions. You really deserve great praise for the, the courage and the vision of, of uh, your decisions there as well. Well, I can share more of the background, but the most important thing from my perspective as a president is that the software that you, I mean the consortium responsible for the development of Koali, obviously we played a significant role in getting that rolling but is now uh, a true consortial operation. The software that you have developed works and that of course is what at the end of the day is the most important thing. Uh, we went live ourselves with the, some of the Koali financial modules in 2009 and we will complete our migration next year. We now have started using Koali Coes for grants administrations from faculty members who, who submit uh, uh, grant applications to grants.gov. We use Koali Ready for uh, emergency preparedness and business continuity planning. And, and this has been particularly helpful because I have uh, consolidated responsibility for cybersecurity, for physical security, for environmental safety, and a number of other related offices, all of these under a single university officer who, who oversees all of these and has direct control of all of these areas from a, a true all threats perspective as far as the university is concerned across all of our eight campuses around the state. First time we've ever been able to achieve this, this level of, of oversight and transparency of what we are doing. I use Koali Mobile myself on my iPhone and last year we routed or approved over 2 million electronic business transactions using the workflow system from Koali Rice. So we are participating in a number of Koali projects that are also in development as well. And I recite this list because all of these meetings and, and, and the, the buzz about Koali, which is obviously significant, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter if the software does not meet university needs. And working software is clearly the minimum bar for credibility and further investment. The most remarkable aspect of Koali is that it far exceeds that minimum bar. At the same time, it further strengthens the community of researchers, software designers, and many of the actual system users who have worked together over the years to create these systems. In my years in higher education, I've observed many models for multi-institutional and multinational collaboration and some work better than others. Some repeat, uh, some retreat into self-perpetuating ritual while others draw out ideas, passion and resources. And I've seen every variation in between those as well. Some consume themselves with busyness. We've certainly seen some of those. 
while others demonstrate truly remarkable outcomes that benefit all participants. And I think what I've seen in the work of the Koali Consortium really, um, really is remarkable and I think exemplifies the, the best of those models. And the numbers themselves really are quite compelling. Well over $50 million in investment by the participating institutions across eight distinct projects. 72 investing institutions and firms in one or more projects. It really is remarkable. 72. 61 members of the Koali Foundation already, including 10 commercial firms. Real implementation, real implementations at, 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 a, at a multiplicity of highly varying institutions. Apparently 175 mailing lists and wikis to coordinate the different parts of, of the work. And almost 1,500 at the Koali All Hands, on the Koali All Hands community list. I mean, that, that is clearly uh, evidence of a, uh, a very substantial and deep collaboration. It really in some ways defies expectation that a not-for-profit legal entity with four to five staff members could reasonably enable the complex work of so many institutions and people. But the success of this community is not just in its structure, but also in the people in the room, in all of you and others at your institutions. I know from observing firsthand when I, when I was CIO the, the work at IU and the, the enormous hours that people put in and the, the, enormous, the enormous passion. I remember, I remember Bar Barry once, once saying, almost grabbing me by the lapels and saying, saying, he said, other people care about networks, other people care about supercomputing, I care about administrative systems. So I, again, I, I observe that this pattern of, of staff collaboration in, in Kuali really, really does reflect the time-tested values of the university where, as I said before, a, a model we've, that we're familiar with, that teams of researchers from multiple institutions collaborate on the frontiers of medicine and physics and many other areas of research and scholarship, and exactly a variation on that that is, that is happening here as well. And, and the collaborative approach that that you exemplify really does embrace the values of the academy. Universities face many opportunities and challenges as, as we continue our, what I think really is our un unending work to refit our institutions to an evolving world. In fact, as I'm always fond of saying, the, the genius of great universities, and universities are institutions that have lasted more than just about any other institution in human history. In fact, only probably the Catholic Church is older than universities. Their genius is their ability to adapt while preserving their fundamental missions of, of education and research. And, and, and you can see this genius when you, when you look at the ancient learned institutions of, of Asia, the Middle East and, and Africa, and the, the great medieval new universities of Europe, um, Oxford, Cambridge, Bologna, Paris, these institutions have remained in continuous operation for almost a millennium. And this, I think, really emphatically confirms the, the, the enduring and adaptive nature of the educational endeavour that we continue to, to, to celebrate. It, 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 it is instructive to, to compare universities as institutions to, to corporations. I mentioned um, uh, Oxford, uh, which is the oldest uh, European um, institution as well. But Egypt uh, at uh, El Azhar University, that was founded in about 970, the university where President Obama gave an extraordinarily eloquent speech a couple of years ago. In Morocco, the University of al Karouine was founded in 1859, sorry, 859, still functioning today. Um, not exactly a university as we understand it, but some of the fundamentals are there. Uh, the, there is a university in, um, in China, Nanjing, which claims an unbroken lineage going back to the second century BC, so in which case it's older than the Catholic Church. Uh, the University of Nalanda in India existed from the fifth century to 1197, 1700, about 1700 years before it was destroyed by the Mughals as well. So universities are institutions that that really have enormous long levity and, and, it, and there's a lot to say about how they're able to adapt to change but it's also 
something about how fundamental their mission is to, to, to the human race. It's interesting when you compare them with corporations. I, was, I, spoke, I gave a keynote at Educors a few weeks ago. I was actually looking for an example of what was the oldest uh, corporation in the world. The oldest we could find was a company in Sweden, which is today Sweden's largest producer of electricity. It dates back to 1288. It wasn't making electricity back then. Um, but it was, uh, uh, it was a timber company back, uh, back then. But it did exist uh, back then. It was about the oldest we could find. But then I just gave you a list of a whole stack of universities that, that are older. But of course, companies are susceptible to fluctuating markets. This Swedish company was once in timber, now in electricity. Uh, susceptible to economic downturns. And, and even the strongest and, and, and best corporations are vulnerable and will always act in their own self-interest in order to survive in the interest of their, their shareholders. So given the choice between the two, I would certainly bet on universities to survive, in part because of uh, the nature of their fundamental mission and their ability to, to evolve. So with this in mind, I want to conclude by encouraging all the leaders who are here today to look beyond past successes that, uh, that you're here to both discuss and celebrate uh, and, and your present work and, and how to, to think differently given the, the, the decade in front of us for higher education. In the same way that Steve Jobs assembled software, a touchscreen, Wi-Fi and a long life battery to create the iPad, what are the missing elements that we might assemble to aid our universities as we adapt to a changing world? Can this be, be used for momentum in this community to, to, to think differently? Well, we know for certain that the capacity of digital networks among US institutions is, is growing by orders of magnitude. The uh, Internet 2 will complete the, the US un, uh, Universal Community Anchor Network, so-called US UCAN, in 2012, next year. And this will have 100... Uh, gigabit uh, capacity. We, I think, as some people know, uh, Indiana University manages and operates the Internet 2 network and is in fact implementing UCAN at the moment. In fact, the new Internet 2 network has the capacity for 88 of these 100 uh, gigabit waves that is a total capacity of 8.8 .8 terabits. Now, the technical details of this don't matter, but what does matter um, is what we do with that extraordinary capacity between our institutions. The economics, when you start thinking about what is almost infinite bandwidth, 8.8 .8 terabits, the economics of local servers, of, of small data centres, these are going to face tremendous, enormous economic challenges when the, when the economies of scale that, that almost, almost free, almost limitless network connectivity can bring about. Now, some have suggested that the cloud, and particularly the commercial cloud, will solve our problems. And this, of course, as we all know, is the concept du jour. But reflect for a minute or so on the, on the fundamental missions of, of universities, the, the fundamental missions of education and research. And, and what's at the heart of this really is a focus on the, the creation, the preservation, and the dissemination of information and knowledge. That's what we are about as institutions. And such information and knowledge is, is essential for universities. In fact, I would argue it's essential for the human race. And what happens when we turn, when we turn to the cloud, the commercial cloud, and potentially lose control of these resources? If we outsource responsibility for these resources, outsource storage of our information and knowledge that we have created, who will be interested in the long-term curatorial tasks associated with these resources. And I'm not just talking curatorial tasks for five years, for 10 years. I'm talking it for 50 years, for 100 years. I'll give two examples. Um, I remember uh, John Chambers, the, the, the chairman and CEO of, of Cisco, is one of, actually one of our alums, having a conversation with him uh, a couple of years ago, and he pointed out that at the time we had that conversation that... Uh, of um, that, that five years before that, there was a list, uh, a list of the ten leading uh, network companies uh, in, the, in the world, and of that ten, in, sorry, in the United States, of that ten, at the time of our conversation, only three existed. 
and that's the, the rate at which uh, IT companies are created and destroyed in many ways in an eco economically very important and significant way, but, but it is a reality of, of the situation. I mean, another example, when I was still CIO, Brad chaired a, a, a committee uh, for me uh, that where, where I asked this committee to tell me, uh, to ask our best researchers, and it was a committee that was packed with National Academy members and, and uh, some of our major scholars, to tell me from their perspective what they really wanted from information technology in the future. We had been hearing a lot about the importance of um, uh, uh, of waves, of, of um, uh, uh, high-speed, uh, reconfigurable, point-to-point -point, um, uh, network connections. And uh, I was skeptical of these arguments, but I wanted to hear it directly from the mouths of the researchers. And interestingly, what we heard from the researchers was they thought the network connectivity was just fine. Uh, when it came to, to computational resources, they understood it was simply a matter of dollars. You put in X million dollars, you got out why teraflops of computing power. It's no longer the exotic, supercomputing is no longer the exotic business it was when I first got into it. It's now, it's now really uh, pretty much just a matter of dollars. What they wanted was storage. What they wanted was, was the ability to store uh, their data. Um, and, and, what, and what they wanted was not just uh, data that could be stored and then, and then disappear when the graduate student who was looking after uh, that particular server graduated and, uh, and no one knew how to extract the data anymore because the software they were using is, is no longer being produced. What they, um, what they wanted was the long-term cur curation and preservation of their data. Uh, and what, as one of them said, I, I want my data not only for my graduate students to be able to use, and here we're talking non-replicable data, which, which probably is the majority of data. It's most data in the life sciences is non-replicable. Uh, most data say in something like astronomy is non-replicable. Anything you can do by simulation is repl replicable, but the rest is not. He said, not only do I want this data to be available for my graduate students, I want it to be available for my graduate students' graduate students. Another one said uh, that, uh, that it was important to store the data noise and all. He didn't want the, to compress the data with algorithms to compress it down times 10. He wanted to be able to store it noise and all. He said, because today's noise is tomorrow's information as we improve the algorithms for information extraction out of, out of data. And they were very compelling arguments, and that led to a major initiative to uh, put in place uh, a, 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 a very large data storage facility that represented a collaboration between the IS people at IU who really understand long-term data curation and the large data researchers who have, have um, large-scale data needs over time. So if we outsource then the responsibility for these resources and, and outsource the, the, the storage of the information knowledge that I just described, as I said, who will be interested in the long-term curatorial tasks associated with these resources? This turn to the cloud sounds very similar to the promises of the past 15 years for big ERP systems that ultimately proved to be very expensive and in many ways quite constraining for a long time. Even The Economist writes about the, the, the need, quote, for computing firms not to fall back on bad old habits by trying to lock in customers as computing becomes a utility and supplied in the cloud as a service, unquote. That's not me speaking, that's not Brad speaking, that's The Economist speaking, the great uh, bastion of, of free market economics. and, and uh, uh, but they see the, uh, the, the difficulties here. And this problem only becomes worse as firms become distracted by buying and selling each other, I mean, perfectly legitimate activities, or turn to their, their next um, uh, ventures to, 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 to make more money. Again, perfectly legitimate is what they do. Um, but our interests are, are, are going to be different as, as institutions. And the term cloud does raise the possibility of aggregation and efficiency among institutions in terms of software and services. So with our own vast networking capacity, as I said, all but infinite bandwidth between our institutions, our own open source software systems like, like Koali, and our community of, of uh, Koali commercial affiliates who provide services around this open software, and, and the same for Sakai and many other systems as well, we should consider the, the, the remarkable possibilities of maybe combining all these in some ways and how, how we may be able to, to use this 
to, to, to think differently in the future. How might our institutions assemble our collective resources to generate economies of scale by creating our own cloud tailored to our own needs? As I said, compare the long levity of universities versus, versus companies in information technology. Even, even uh, our, our IU is nearly 200 years old. It's much older than IBM, which is, I think, about the oldest of the information technology companies. Could we not create a cloud that protects our interests over the next decade and beyond and that preserves for the long term the information and knowledge that we have created and which we continue to create? By combining our own resources or by contracting for them at scale in models like Internet2, and uh, like Internet2 is doing with um, its uh, Net Plus services recently, recently announced, universities could avoid the loss of control and the the arduous ERP contracting and mergers that have consumed so much of the last 15 years and have consumed a considerable amount of our funding as well. So a final question that all of this raises is, is, is how do you persuade yourselves and others about, uh, uh, sorry, those at your institutions who are making decisions, the decision makers, to seriously consider open source community software as a legitimate contender for some of your institution's most vital systems? Well, my answer to, to that question is, is shaped by, by my, my years, 15 years, uh, as successively the VP for IT and CIO, as then VP for research and then provost and then as a university president. My, this is my fifth year in that job. And I think the, the, the argument is really simple. Open source community software as a concept and as a reality has been at the core of university research since the advent of computing. It's not new. And it is now increasingly so at the core of administration at a growing number of universities. One isn't buying into some radical new idea by, by um, uh, committing to the use of, of such software. Uh, one, is, one is in fact using a model that is probably older than some of the the, the other models that underpin some of the other systems. And it is, as I said, it is more than just Kuali and Sakai, but includes uh, uh, systems like, the, like Apache and many, many others as well, hundreds of others, thousands of others. And I think it's now demonstrably clear that the open source model works for research and administration. And it's also clear that it really does represent um, genuine, true, effective collaboration between and among universities. It does draw, I mean, it has lived up to its promise by drawing on the very best uh, experts and uh, I think some of the, 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 the best implementers across the country and around the world, uh, 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 something that we'd all wanted to, uh, to see happen. And ultimately, it really does demonstrably save money. It has, it has uh, saved us a considerable amount of money. Well. I think this talk um, uh, has raised, um, obviously raised some questions, but, but hopefully from the point of view of somebody who's been intimately involved in these, these efforts, at least, at least certainly at the outset, and has watched them develop with um, enormous uh, pleasure, uh, I hope it at least gives you some, some sense of, of uh, why this as, a, as an initiative I think is uh, and open source software more generally, community-based software more generally, uh, really is a is a viable alternative um, for for institutions, and I and I think it does reflect the very best attributes of of universities: the the ability to to collaborate and cooperate on complex, difficult problems, and to come up with with superb uh, solutions that are in the very essence transformational and. Uh, again, to, to all of you in the room, so many of you have contributed to this effort, so many of you are considering uh, participating um, uh, in uh, Kuali in one form or the other. Uh, I, I you have my, you know, my enormous admiration and respect for all that, uh, all that you have achieved and done to have gone from basically nothing to a meeting with 800 plus people and so many participants in such a short period of time as a is, is an achievement I think that all of you can be immensely proud of. So uh, it's been a, a great honour and pleasure to talk to you. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Michael. Um, you know, maybe I, I should offer one, one refinement. I said a, a quiet advocate behind the scene, and perhaps quiet was exaggerated. Um, I was trying to board a plane in Amsterdam last year after attending a meeting there, and I got an email from Michael, which makes my Blackberry uh, flash in white, you know, like flashing red, hot, white. And it was, it, it was something like, is KFS done? This, that was about it. So I responded to him and I said, uh, mostly done, you know, more work coming, but it's being implemented. Who's implementing it? So I'm scurrying around trying to remember and check on my Blackberry. And so I write, well, Cornell goes next month or, you know, and, and such. And Naval Postgraduate is up. And, and I got, you know, I'm trying to board the plane and I get about eight rounds of questions from Michael. And uh, as he will recall, he was at a, a meeting somewhere with some presidents and provosts. And someone had raised some misinformation about Kowali, and he was darn sure going to set them straight. <laughs> and he did. <laughs> He did. When he got back to his room that night, uh, I, I, uh, I got home, we, we, I gave him a fuller briefing, or actually I think I emailed Jennifer or someone who gave him a fuller briefing, so I think the next morning he was well armed uh, for that conversation. So, uh, Michael, I know this is immensely appropriate for you because uh, anytime you get a, a discretionary chance to go out and have dinner with Michael, sushi is always on the menu. And uh, given that Kowali means walk, we uh, issue engraved chopsticks for each release, each first, for the first release of each major system. And uh, HR and mobility uh, have their first major release. So you can actually use those, but to more appropriately display our thanks, we have some more ceremonial chopsticks with a plaque thanking you for all that you've done. Thanks, bro. <laughs>